yeah, so uh, hello, um, and I'll introduce our talk today. Uh, so yeah, today we have Dr. Adam Finkel of the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where he is a clinical professor of environmental health sciences. His broad and interdisciplinary research interests span environmental health, public administration, economics, law, and decision theory uh, via the quantitative assessment of risks. Today, he'll be discussing quantitative uncertainty analysis and how that can aid decision makers to better acknowledge uncertainty. So yeah, take it away. Well, thank you, Simon and uh, Scott Furson, who uh, we go back a very long way. I have a daughter in college who was not even born yet when, when you missed your first deadline for me. So uh, glad to be here. Uh, please interrupt and ask questions. This is uh, kind of a hybrid talk that's partly analytic, uh, and, but mostly policy. So I'm trying to appeal to uh, both audiences, but if, if I jump around too much and it gets distracting, uh, stop me. But I, I wanted to sort of try to give a, a broad overview of really now still going on 35 years, thinking about uncertainty and risk, but, but from the point of view of somebody who uh, I think helped to pioneer some of the uh, nitty gritty of the techniques, but has really turned uh, my attention uh, Ever since I was in government, I was the uh, chief scientist at the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration for uh, six years in the Clinton administration. Uh, to the, the the problem of decision making under uncertainty and the uh, difficulty that that decision makers have uh, and that analysts uh, contribute to. So that's what I'm going to mostly talk about. So uh, three themes that uh, we on the uh, analytic side have I think done. Uh, particularly on the risk side of the cost benefit ledger, a really good job of improving methods to uh, be transparent and humble and acknowledging uh, both uncertainty and variability in risk. But, but this is futile because of three bigger flaws in the system. First, that decision makers are, have always acted as these empty vessels into which uh, uncertainty can be poured, and I guess to ruin the metaphor, there is sort of poured in and then uh, just leaks right out the other end without being uh, used in any way. Uh, secondly, that economists who have really an equal share in the job of deciding or, or presenting information about pros and cons of policies, they work on the cost side, they are decades behind the risk scientists in terms of being uh, truthful and uh, uh, precise uh, about uncertainty and variability. And then thirdly, that even when it works well, all we're doing is collaborating with each other to dissect problems rather than to compare solutions. And really these tools ought to be used in the process of comparing solutions. Um, I meant to put a slide, I should say, you know, I, I really don't know who I'm speaking to here, but with, with Scott on the line, I just want to make it clear that I guess I come out of the tradition such as it is of viewing uncertainty as something that that can be uh, expressed in precise terms, probability distributions, density functions, whatever. But I think everything I'm going to talk about is, is equally applicable to uh, I'm throwing out jargon I don't understand now, P-boxes and cupulas and the stuff that Scott does. Uh, if, if it doesn't, then stop me and tell me so. But I, I don't think it should matter whether you're one of these people who doesn't believe in percentiles. Uh, this should be familiar to, to everybody. Um, I've always felt it's a problem that the terms we use, means and variances and percentiles are interchangeable in terms of their use both for distributions of true uncertainty, which is, which is basically our fault. It's thing, it's, we, we should know more, but our measurements or our brains are not big enough to, uh, to find the, the one truth that's out there. So we have to talk about confidence intervals or, or error bars or, or P boxes. Uh, and uncertainty for the decision maker, whether you acknowledge it or not, forces you to think or, or should force you to think about uh, things like, you know, to what extent should we be safe rather than sorry? Whereas variation, variability is, is a property of the universe. It's not reducible. Uh, people's heights and weights are distributed as they are. 
um, but we can understand better how that property is distributed. And although we sometimes use the same terms, and I'll show on the next slide uh, how we do this, it really is a very different uh, practical mindset because it forces you to think not about uh, precaution in the broad sense, but in precaution in dividing people from each other, who gets to be safe and who ends up being sorry. So there's been a large uh, cottage industry for many years talking about exaggeration of risk. Uh, it's got its own uh, voodoo and, and its own uh, cult figures, but they, you know, they tend to throw out terms like uh, overly precautionary and conservative and exaggerating and tsunami of regulations and all this stuff really indiscriminately. And, and sometimes they don't even think about whether they're what they're really advocating are things like the, the door frame that's uh, the building code says that the door should be as high as the best estimate of the person, uh, you know, the average human being's height, which counting children is probably five and a half feet. And so this guy is uh, not being served well by that, that building code. Uh, the guy on the right hand side, uh, fireman carrying somebody else down a ladder, he's not going to be served well by a ladder that is designed only to support the weight of an average person, let alone a, uh, an average person carrying somebody else. So I often end uh, lectures with, with this slide, uh, dates, left-hand side dates back uh, almost 40 years, the right-hand side dates back uh, more than 2,000 years. Uh, to what I consider to be two policy statements, the one on the left from two economists uh, I studied with many years ago saying uh, prescriptively that we should be looking at the expectation of risk and not uh, any of these uh, you know, non-central tendency measures uh, and the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said we should uh, really go out of our way to not look at the central tendency but to look at uh, the most vulnerable. Uh, so I'm going to show a few slides now that come from a paper that I think came out a year or two ago. Um, and I admit I'm, I'm drawing from it in part because it was co-authored uh, by me and George Gray. George was the head of the research arm of EPA under the uh, George W. Bush administration. So two people who really are mostly on different sides of the political spectrum. We're, we're old friends and we, we agree on some things and disagree on many, many others. But we thought it'd be fun to write a paper that was basically, I think I narrowed it down to six or seven for this talk, but we had 10 or 12 principles that we agreed on that, that ought to be uh, uh, rules to live by for depicting and using uh, uncertainty and variability estimates. So these are slides from, from that joint paper and joint talk. So these are just some covers from NAS reports and, and books going back to Bernoulli on the top, uh, well, middle column there on the top. Uh, and I guess the most recent is Taleb's uh, Black Swan. Maybe that's, maybe that's 10 years old, but it's, you know, uncertainty has been uh, a recurring topic for a very, very long time, as you guys know. Uh, this is a monograph <clears throat> that I wrote now 30 years ago uh, when I was at Resources for the Future, um, you know, not suggesting a linear pathway here, but you know, my thing came out, Science Magazine said, um, Finkel is calling for EPA and other agencies to admit how squishy the numbers are and to factor it into their assessments. And uh, you know, a year or two afterwards, uh, the deputy administrator of EPA put out a memorandum, which is probably still being referred to there uh, that says things like, uh, you know, point estimates of risk don't convey uh, what we don't know. And it's not useful to boil down this information when you throwing away so much of uh, what, what the, the truth is, which is we, we need to be honest about what we don't know. Uh, 1995, uh, I think this may have been the first Monte Carlo simulation in the, in the risk literature that looked at a, uh, explicitly at the, at the comparison of two risks, both of which were uncertain and variable. So making the point that while people say, or maybe used to say more, that uh, risk assessment is, uh, is good for rank ordering things, but maybe not so good for making precise estimates of things, uh, my viewpoint was it's actually the opposite, that it's twice as hard or x squared as hard to, to know how to rank order two uncertain things uh, that it is to make a, a decent 
guesstimate of, of each one singly because that's how uncertainty propagates. So this was motivated by the uh, uh, controversy in the early 1990s about uh, a growth hormone called Alar that was used on the US apple crop and it ultimately was withdrawn by its manufacturer when a positive cancer study in animals came out. And Bruce Ames, who I just checked, he's still around uh, doing work. He's in his mid 90s now. Uh, he developed the Ames test for mutagenicity in the 1970s. He quite famously uh, continued to say over and over again, wherever he could get a platform, that we shouldn't be so concerned about this uh, chemical uh, on apples, which made its way into apple juice that babies and kids were drinking because uh, peanut butter, which kids also eat, has aflatoxin in it, which he, which he said was, sometimes he said 18 times, sometimes he said 17.9 times, um, sometimes he said roughly 20 times, but he said uh, uh, peanut butter is that much worse for you uh, than apple juice is. And I took a look at the both the uncertainty in the um, the animal bioassay for ALAR, the human epidemiology on aflatoxin, the variation in how much peanut butter and apple juice people consume at a given age and the variability in the concentration of these substances in the food stuff and simulated uh, on the uncertainty in the ratio of the two risks. So this is a log 10 scale, uh, UDMH is the metabolite of, of ALAR. So it's basically apple juice over peanut butter uh, ratio of, of risk. And you see the little pink bar, uh, which I hope the previous slide was showing just the, the pink bar. And when you take the, pull back the curtains on this, you see that uh, he wasn't wrong to say uh, peanut butter was 20 times worse, roughly, you know, 10 to the negative 1.5 as bad. Uh, but it was drawn from a distribution that runs over seven or eight orders of magnitude and where the central tendency is actually very close to one-to-one. Uh, to one. So we, it really was not fair to say we, we in any way knew that one thing was worse than the other. Uh, just to show there was a time in my life when I really could do this stuff uh, in my head or on a computer, on a calculator. I've long since uh, stopped doing this from the analytic side routinely, but uh, this is from a paper in roughly 1992 in risk analysis where I, I say discovered, probably stumbled across as a better word, but uh, found a relationship that, you know, pretty much in your head if you're able to keep the, the Z table for the normal distribution in your head, uh, it, it tells you how much of the characteristic, if we're thinking now more about variability than uncertainty, if you wanted to know, for example, uh, how much of the federal income tax revenue is paid for by people between the 84th and the 97th percentile of income, uh, the amount of dollars under that curve in this little pink poorly drawn region is a, is a function of the, the percentiles and there's a relationship between them. So in, in this case, basically 34% um, uh, of the characteristic is contained within the 13% that's between those two uh, standard deviation of, of one and, and two. Uh, I don't want to take too long on this slide, but this, because it's hard to explain, but this was just to show that, you know, we really also have to think about uh, variation in in preference or in in severity of risk. It's not just exposure and and toxicity. Uh, so this is a pretty old slide, but it comes from. Uh, it's a little bit different now, but but certainly for many many years, uh, physicians would tell uh, their female patients who were pregnant that if you, well, if you're 30 years old, like. 30 years and a day or older, uh, you, you, you ought to get an amniocentesis to see if your uh, fetus has Down syndrome because the probability of causing a miscarriage by having the procedure uh, at age 30, which is the flat pink line here, um, equals the probability of having uh, a fetus with Down syndrome, which is the upward sloping uh, blue line uh, in the middle of this graph. Um, I guess they crossed at 35. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it used to be 35. Maybe I'm misremembering. But in any, any event, the point of the slide is that that's true, uh, but it, it, it hides the fact that it, it only is the right age 
to make that decision or the right uh, inflection point if you, the patient, and maybe your husband and family believe that the two outcomes are equally uh, severe. Uh, if you're the kind of person that would have much more regret causing a miscarriage than carrying a baby to term with Down syndrome, then you should not be told uh, that because the curves cross at age 35, that's when you should uh, switch your mindset from not testing to testing. Uh, your your breakpoint would be would be a very different age. So too much to go through on this slide, but just to give a flavor that really what we're talking about in the policy world when we're talking about the need to make decisions about what hazards to regulate and if so, how, how stringently using what uh, controls uh, that we're really talking about roughly uh, at least qualitatively, we're talking about overestimation or underestimation both of cost and benefit. And the imprecision, the, the uh, ignorance uh, comes in all four of those uh, two by two uh, cells in that table. And this is just roughly to suggest that uh, I've been at this a, a very long time in the policy world and overwhelmingly the, the quote conventional wisdom is that the methods that we use um, overestimate risk, the upper right hand corner and underestimate cost. And my research largely has been to show that uh, the opposite is more true than the conventional wisdom, that we have lots of reasons to believe that we are underestimating uh, risk and therefore underestimating benefits and that we're overestimating cost. So now to get into the meat of this paper with, with George Gray, this comes I think right from the paper that uh, way back at the beginning, um, um, Dick Wilson and Edmund Crouch and Lawrence Ice said, and, and great quote, a decision made without taking uncertainty into account is really worth causing a decision. And yet, uh, as we'll see, there's still rampant uh, examples of decisions being made based on po point estimates. And it, it continues not only to happen, but to be encouraged by panels and individu individu individuals and committees as the right way uh, to do things. That uncertainty assessment is quote, not helpful or confusing or too difficult or wrong. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, if this works, here's a 45 second pop culture reference. Uh, I hope people heard that. I'm not seeing very many live faces on this chat. Everybody's uh, got their screens off. But in any event, I, I uh, hope that was audible. It was a little quiet, I think. But, okay. Well, yeah. basically, it was from the <laughs> Simpsons movie from, I don't know, 2005 or so. And uh, the president being played by the voice of Arnold Schwarzenegger says, "I uh, here are your five options. He picks number three without thinking about it and says, I was uh, put here to lead, not to read. And there's then another scene later in the movie uh, where the guy from EPA brings five more options. And this time the president says, uh, I, I, you know, I want to know what I'm doing here. So the guy sort of waves his hands and talks him through these five options. But basically he says, uh, how about number two? And he said, yeah, that sounds good. Well, no, maybe more than that. Well, how about four? No, how about, you know, we could have given some body language. Okay, I pick three. He ends up in the same place anyway. And the point just is to show that uh, you can have decision makers who want to be told what to do. Uh, you can have decision makers who want to believe that they're in charge and are and are making the decision themselves, but they're being uh, sort of led uh, by the by a rope around their neck by the analyst to think that they're making the decision, but actually it's all been uh, prearranged by how the numbers are portrayed. So here we say, um, if you only have point estimates and the person in charge says, uh, you know, I, I've got three options, I pick A because its benefits uh, are precise and they exceed its costs. Uh, we, you don't need a decision maker to do that. You can uh, save that whole salary and get a calculator and and do that. We need uh, decision makers who can look at these options and say, um, I, I know that nothing in life is guaranteed. I, I know that I should be telling uh, my constituents or, or my uh, citizens that uh, 
the best we can do is to choose the best we can do and that and that uh, it may not be it may not turn out to be the best choice after the fact but it seems to be the best choice before the fact because we've thought about the uncertainties the variations uh, and the errors and the consequences of error uh, anyway this this is just a title slide of the of the paper it's in uh, environment systems and decisions uh, more of the same so we're tempted to respond when people say which i think is valid that decision makers want point estimates uh, our quip would be uh, then we need different decision makers if, if that's really true uh, you know they're the problem not anything else uh, but to be more constructive uh, we've come up with some principles that we think can maybe help people meet uh, at least maybe halfway maybe maybe uh, part of the way so I'm going to skip around and, and just do some of these uh, which are some are more obvious than others here, but uh, uncertainty and variability are, are, are the reality. The point estimates are either useful or useless abstractions or falsehoods. Um, I've already talked about safe and sorry. So what do I mean by a useful falsehood? Uh, if, if you're going to use a point estimate to enable the human mind to, to make a decision, it is admittedly hard to think about um, comparing probability distributions to each other or P boxes or smears of different colored possibilities over each other, you, you at least need to sort of ground your thinking in um, more concrete, to use a, uh, maybe a better word than precise, more concrete uh, representations of what might happen. Uh, at, at least that point estimate needs to be understood as representing something. And then it needs to be actually a, a good faith estimate of what it purports to be. So in practice, this means that we think the decision maker ought to be the one to ask for something specific. I, I would like to know what the expected value here is. I'd like to know what uh, a 90th or 99th percentile upper bound is or a fifth percentile lower bound is because he or she understands what the value decision that's embodied in that request is. Okay, so in other words, somebody, I will not go through this example because I've done it way too many times and people roll their eyes at it. But um, if, you, if you think about without getting into great detail about it, the everyday decision, uh, well, back when we used to go out of our homes and, and go places, I guess, uh, I'm, I'm going to the, I need to catch a plane. I need to know when to leave my house to get to the airport. Uh, and if you, hired somebody to tell you all of the things that could happen between uh, your home and the and the being first in line at, at the gate to get on the plane uh, and told you that it you know it could be a short trip it could be a medium length trip it could be a long trip if things went wrong any decision you would make about when to leave your house would embody some implicit value decision between the cost or the consequence or the regret of being early versus being late. If being early had no consequence, you'd obviously leave the day before and, and there'd be no, no reason not to leave um, way, way, way before the plane. If there, if there, but obviously that's not what people do because nobody wants to sit around um, waiting for the plane to take off. But I don't think many people realize that the expectation, the average value of how long it will take to get there is a perfectly reasonable decision only if you are the kind of person who would rather be four minutes late to the plane than five minutes early. Because four minutes of error, obviously four is less than five. Um, even in the US, that's still true. And you would have done, quote, done better by uh, minimizing the, the distance in terms of time between the two events of arriving at the gate and the plane taking off. And if you're truly indifferent as to which comes first, then being four minutes on one side is better than being five minutes on the other. If you uh, are a normal person and, and put some premium on uh, a minute of waiting being not as bad as a minute of watching the plane through the window without you on it, then you would pick a different uh, estimator and and so it's it's not that any of the estimators are wrong it's that they're all right for different 
purposes. And decision makers typically can't get their heads around that. And that causes a lot of uh, misery in, in policymaking. And then secondly here, once that has happened and the decision maker has, has asked for something, uh, then it's up to the analyst to faithfully return the, the desired uh, estimator. So asking somebody for a fifth percentile and the analyst uh, chuckling to himself and giving them the 95th percentile and not telling the decision maker that that's not uh, appropriate or, or fair. I'm going to skip over some of these. The slides, I guess, will be available um, just in the interest of time. I'm going to get to number five in, in a minute in more detail. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one as well. This is about model uncertainty. George and I actually just wrote another paper that we managed to agree on some things about how to reconcile the conflict between putting all of the models into the depiction of uncertainty, which typically uh, causes delay and heartache. And, and if, if what we're really trying to do is improve a situation where uh, every day costs are accruing in, in terms of disease, death, injury, whatever, that are greater than the benefits of, um, of the control, then every day that we sit around and argue about which model to add to the uh, suite of models and what expert derived weights to put on each model uh, is, is making the decision not to do anything. And there's a tension between um, choosing default models that we can then overturn with substantial evidence versus uh, putting everything into the system. All right, so having just skipped through that paper quickly, I want to spend a few minutes talking about uncertainty on the cost side of cost benefit policy. So here's an, an old slide from the far side, um, basically that no matter how good your intentions are, uh, if you only have one symbol, you're not going to make uh, any noise at all, even if you come in at the right time. A uh, couple of papers uh, and a website, uh, actually, that, that's, I think Scott put there uh, with better design skills than I have of, of papers from this uh, grant that was roughly, what, 2008 to 2013 um, on uncertainty in regulatory economics. So a, a paper I wrote about uh, its failure, uh, eventually a book that colleagues of mine at, at Penn and I wrote about uh, the specific effect of regulation on employment. And by the way, the answer to the cover of the book is not really and not in large numbers and sometimes as many or more jobs are created as are destroyed. So here we have, again, for, um, I've got a kind of a 35 year window on this, we have a almost unchanging uh, uh, sense of rhetoric and, and uh, uh, landscape of uttering the same uh, bromides over and over again. Um, here is a, a great utterer of bromides, uh, Cass Sunstein, uh, former head of the regulatory state in the US under Obama. Um, like me, a supporter of cost-benefit analysis, but but and and Cass is not an economist, but but writes in that field now, uh, and you know, just see what he's saying here, um, and this is pretty much all he says in this about this topic in this. So I'm not cherry picking here. He says, I like cost-benefit analysis, but but there are problems with it. Um, science is uncertain. Um, but there's also economic uncertainty. And then he says, um, how do we monetize 30 lives a year? Uh, how do we discount uh, benefits over time? How should we change our valuation to quantify things like human dignity? All of those are good questions, but you notice that the, that the one thing he doesn't talk about is, even though he says some questions are economic, none of those questions have to do, how much does this stuff cost? It's all about, Basically, the benefits are uncertain because there are scientific uncertainties and benefits and there are economic uncertainties. And just completely, and I could give you 100 other quotes like this, completely glosses over uh, the question of, do we have any understanding of what are we spending to get the benefits? 
So the landscape, this is, I think, a pretty old slide of mine now, but it's not changed at all. Uh, economists are saying, risk assessors, you got to do, do a better job. You're giving us benefit estimates that, that aren't uh, useful for, for us to monetize. And I, have, I think I agree with that. Um, but again, nothing much to say at all about cost. And uh, as I mentioned before, even some observations that be, because economists tend not to think about uncertainty, uh, the estimates of GDP and unemployment and job creation or job destruction are made as point estimates. Uh, some people say, um, why, sh why should scientists uh, even try to do it differently? Because it's worked so well uh, on the cost side. A couple of slides on what the problem here is, uh, where the uncertainties are coming from. Um, how do we end up being uncertain or wrong about cost? Well, if we don't think about um, any of these factors and all we say is uh, this, to get to this level of uh, reduction of fine particles in the air um, from our automobiles, we need to put on uh, this piece of equipment on the muffler and it costs $112.08 and they're gonna be 52,300,012 cars that are gonna get one every year and you multiply those numbers and that's, that's what it costs. And if we don't think about economies of scale, um, uh, strategic misestimation and all these other things, then, then we could be wrong. So here are just some, I guess at this point, fairly old uh, comparisons uh, from a paper at Resources for the Future about some of the sort of startling errors in, uh, in how expensive, and in, this, in most of these cases, how less expensive things actually turned out to cost than uh, the agencies uh, professed that they would cost uh, at the time. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but obviously there are in a RIA, a regulatory impact analysis, there, there are sort of a, a hierarchy of how much attention one could pay to uncertainty on the cost side. You could just give a number and not even say the word. You could give a number and throw a few adjectives in there about maybe or possibly or probably um, going all the way up to an elaborate uh, uncertainty analysis with multiple models, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, more importantly, what is this state of practice? Um, here are some EPA rules from the 1990s, I would say it's gotten a little better, but really not much better. But the point here is that that even when uh, two economists, Bob Hahn and I'm not sure if this actually was Susan Dudley or a different Dudley, but anyway, Bob Hahn, an economist at the uh, Brookings Institution, um, even when they looked at regulatory impact analyses and tried to sc and, and scored them on how well they, quote, presented a range of total cost, uh, I went back and looked at these rules with more care, and all but one of them was at the lower end of this 10-point hierarchy. Uh, most of the ones that Han said um, did a, a good job, got a, a check mark for uh, being honest about uncertainty and cost, were actually basically two incompatible numbers connected with a hyphen. So it looked like a range, it looked like a confidence interval, but it wasn't. It was just, uh, it could be, you know, it could be this or it could be that really with two different rules or two different uh, decisions. And if you put a hyphen between them, it kind of looks like you're being uh, forthcoming about uncertainty. Oops, sorry. Here's an example from my former agency uh, at OSHA. This is uh, 15 years old, but they've only regulated one or two other substances in that in that time since then. And, and you don't have to read it, but you can see that total cost is on the first column of numbers and it's uh, nine significant digits to, to the nearest dollar. So there's just zero uh, discussion whatsoever uh, other than at some point they, they will give two different discount rates for how to uh, annualize that cost over uh, 50 years. But other than that, there is no glimmer of explanation that these numbers may be uh, imprecise. Uh, here's an EPA number, the EPA slide. Um, and if you look carefully, you see that, uh, yes, the, uh, the, the, the net benefits are uncertain because there are 14 different 
ways to look at the epidemiology, but in every case, it is, quote, minus the cost estimate. So there, there is no, all the uncertainty, such as it is, is coming from the science side and not the economic side. Uh, so just to talk briefly about why this might persist, why over these decades, <clears throat> people have been spending a lot of effort being more and more forthcoming about quantifying uncertainty and variability in the in the science of cost benefit and not in the in the cost economics. Um, well, here are some speculations. Uh, people could actually believe that uh, uncertainty and cost is small, so sort of why bother? Um, I guess I would say, having looked at a lot of these cases myself, that um, to be a little bit uh, sarcastic, at least risk analysts are, are generally uh, wrong in degree and not wrong in sign. So there are, there are clear cases of economists who have said something will cost positive money when in fact it saved money. So they've gotten it so wrong that the sign of the, uh, of the function was wrong. And there are some strange cases on the risk side where that, that has also happened. But uh, I think if you, if you had to say it in, in one sentence, you would say the cost side can theoretically be, you know, be much wronger than the risk side because we're dealing in risk with things that are either benign or harmful. And on the economic side, we're dealing with ex interventions that could be uh, harmful to the economy on balance, but could actually be uh, salutary to the economy, even putting the benefits aside. We could be doing things that, that actually uh, increase economic welfare when you add up all of the uh, welfare changes uh, properly. There are some normative explanations. Maybe um, it, it's, it's enough to just give a expected value with a sort of a nod to lower and upper, um, because all we're trying to do is, according to some economists, just distinguish the positive from the negative net benefits. And of course, that begs the question, then, then, then why not just do that on the risk side? Why are we spending all this effort uh, being so precise in our imprecision uh, when we're coupling that with an estimate that is designed to be uh, sort of a half-assed estimate? There's some bureaucratic uh, explanation, which I think are probably more powerful than some of these normative ones. Um, and I'll, I think in the next slide, get, get to what I think is the bottom line here. But uh, a lot of these agencies are, are litigation driven. And uh, I think it's fair to say that, that lawyers are intolerant um, of uncertainty. They don't like it when scientists express it either. But um, in my experience as a scientist, uh, confronting lawyers in my agency, I would just say, sorry, you know, th this is, it is what it is. And for whatever reason, economists have not been as willing to, to challenge that. And then there are disciplinary things. Um, maybe economists think more in point estimates, maybe um, the rise of the Freakonomics uh, subculture uh, has just made it uh, sort of a career path to be clever and insightful and uncertainty analysis and error bounds are just kind of grunt work. And, and we who are on a uh, steep career path to fame and fortune don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, here's just a quote or two from um, probably cherry picking, but some economists who have really gone out of their way to say, um, we're smarter than everybody else. Um, there's obviously a lot of poaching that's going on uh, field across field. Uh, certainly, in my experience, 2020, um, where I live in central New Jersey, uh, I'm sure it's this way in a lot of other places, I've started to use the term uh, realtor epidemiologist. We have a lot of realtors in our town who are amateur epidemiologists telling people what COVID is all about and why masks don't work and so forth. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, economist epidemiologists. We have um, one of the Freakonomics guys, I think it's uh, Stephen Levitt, um, has written about this, that uh, my training gives me this magic ability to see relationships that nobody else can see. This is what economists do. Uh, so don't, don't bother us with, with your uh, pedestrian thoughts of uncertainty. We're, we're just above all that. Um, here is a 
health economist who said, my training is really better than public health or medicine for discerning uh, which things are real and which things aren't. So if, if, if you have a magic insight uh, into what's causal and what's not, uh, then, then maybe it's deflating to announce your revealed wisdom with imprecision. Um, maybe I didn't put the slide down, but I, I guess my, my summary of those last couple of slides would just be to say that if, if I'm right and there's some uh, hubris about being an economist that then meets up with the demands of lawyers in the system and judges, by the way, as well, and maybe what's really going on is that both in the science and the economics, lawyers and judges view error bars as uh, evidence of, of weakness or of failure, then if it's true that scientists know that, but they're for whatever reason unwilling to play along, and if certainly when I was an agency scientist, if somebody told me, you're not done yet, you've given me a point estimate with, with a distribution around it, um, you know, go home and work uh, for free and, you know, don't come back until you've gotten it right. Uh, I would say, you, you got this all wrong. You know, I'm, I'm done. I've given you the true story of, of what we know. And telling me to, to go back and erase the error bars is not going to change the reality. If economists, for whatever reason, are more willing um, to not produce those error bars in the first place or to say, oh, excuse me, I, I made a mistake here. I'll come back tomorrow with those error bars gone and make you feel better, then that maybe that's how we've ended up uh, with this situation. This slide is not so important. It just says if you, if you wanted to do it right, here's some ways you could do it. And really the last thing I want to do for 10 more minutes, and we'll be at about under an hour here, is putting the two pieces together and talking about uh, a way in which analysts and decision makers might uh, collaborate better, thinking not only about uncertainty and variability, but about what their, what their jobs really are and how to serve society better uh, by sort of reconstruing what, what their relationships are to each other, but also what their, what their jobs are. So I was on an NAS committee in roughly 2008 uh, called Science and Decisions. And with some cajoling on, on my part and some well-meaning resistance from others, we, we ended up with a chapter that began the discussion of using science to uh, in, improve and inform decisions and starting the discussion of doing that not the traditional way, which is to sort of dissect the problem for a while, right? We, 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 we identify something as a problem and then we tell analysts both on the science and the economic side, you know, go out there and tell me how much harm is being caused by this problem and how much it might cost to eliminate this problem or reduce it in some way. Um, usually reducing it in a unspecified way. So, you know, 100 units of this thing are in the air. Uh, how many people are dying because of this? And what would happen? Uh, how much would it cost if we got it down to 50? Um, you know, and then we compare the 50 lives saved to the cost of that and decide whether that's a good idea or not. Well, there's a whole nother way to, to think about this exercise, which is uh, to, to put solutions first, to think about what is the human need? I probably should have said here the human want. I'm not trying to be pejorative about uh, products or desires or, 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 or happiness or joy or wants or whatever, but a need or a want that is uh, wholly or partially unfulfilled. Uh, and then think about what are the policy and technological options that we have to address this and to and to increase the, the welfare by fulfilling that need in a better way, better in in usually in the sense of a of a, of a net risk reducing way, considering the economic changes as well. So I'm not going to play any of it, but if you uh, want to click on this link at the bottom, uh, my former colleague Andrew Maynard, who's now at uh, University of Arizona, um, he and I 
and others did a long project for the Sloan Foundation on synthetic biology. And uh, Andrew does these great uh, videos called Risk Bites, and he did about a six minute risk bite on this uh, term I, I coined called solution focused uh, risk assessment. And it basically goes through on a whiteboard how you might think about uh, putting the discussion of solutions first. So I'll just give one example of that. Uh, endocrine disruptors in drinking water. So EPA uh, has been agonizing for a long time now about various uh, plasticizers that are contained in the bottle itself and which slowly leach into the drinking water that people consume in these in these bottles. So bisphenol A was the first of these. Uh, after many years, there was now a uh, some number of parts per billion that's acceptable uh, in the drinking water. Uh, immediately, manufacturers started putting something else in, uh, and this will go on forever. There will be more and more uh, advisory or mandatory limits for each of these substances, because the problem has been construed as we want the water in these bottles to be acceptably free of endocrine disruption effects. The problem has not been construed as we want consumers to have ready access to clean cold drinking water. If the problem was construed that way, someone might ask, how did it happen that when Scott and I were teenagers, let's say, uh, the number of plastic bottles uh, again, I'm sorry for the US centric uh, data here throughout my talk, but uh, the US number is now 49 billion of these bottles per year. And when Scott and I were teenagers, the number was zero. There just no one had thought that a product that falls from the sky should be or could be sold to people for three or four dollars a unit in a plastic container. And yet, I don't remember being thirsty uh, in those days and thinking, if only the market would provide me with some other way to drink water. Uh, maybe I'm better off. I mean, I'm not denying that, that it's more convenient. But the fact is, we used to have an infrastructure uh, that involved a lot more uh, public drinking fountains. Um, this slide obviously is uh, uh, not a great slide to show in the middle of a pandemic. But putting that aside for the, for the moment, uh, if the question was, could we adjust the market through incentives or taxes or subsidies or nudges or whatever, um, maybe we could actually do something about the greenhouse footprint of these 49 billion bottles, the energy use, the disposal uh, problems of putting these plastics in the ground uh, to the tune of 49 billion of them a year. Uh, but if all we do is set more and more limits on obscure substances, we're not thinking about the actual problem. That's how that's what I would argue. So uh, some fairly wordy slides. But uh, if you look at the bottom here, um, I think you're more likely to, to make a good choice if you think your way from solutions to problems rather than starting from this dissection and somebody finally getting impatient and saying, well, you know, now we're ready to pick a number, you know, you've had your five years or 10 years, and, and now we're going to put our hand on an invisible dial and tell, and tell society where, where to lower the exposure to. And I would assert that the earlier that you force people to think about what can be done, uh, the more likely you are to think of better ways to do it, uh, things which can occur to you after you've stopped thinking about the problem in its broad uh, context. So this is uh, not new. It comes from decision theory, uh, cumulative risk assessment, life cycle analysis, uh, Nick Ashford's uh, uh, technology options analysis. It's just that Nick is sort of not a, a fan of quantitative cost benefit balancing. So he says it a different way. Um, even the Bjorn Lomberg and the Copenhagen consensus, which I'm not a huge fan of, but the, the fact that he uh, and others have, have thought about this and construed the problem and written the books in the form of how to spend money to make the world a better place, that to me is a much more sensible question than 
let's put, you know, if there are books that are called, you know, the top 10 things to worry about, and at least, you know, the, the, the way to triage the actual thing that we are running out of, which is time and money and, and resources, the, the, the allocation of those finite things to increasing of welfare is a better way to think about it than just putting the problems in order. So here's my, maybe the last slide. This is a, uh, a Russian concept, uh, the ideal final result. Um, this is meant to show we can design a better lawnmower, uh, one that pollutes less, is less noisy, less likely to cut your feet off when you have an accident. Uh, but if we, if we instead thought about, uh, you know, do we really need lawns? Maybe we don't, but if we're gonna have them, could we uh, use synthetic biology and change the properties of the grass so it grows to three inches and then stops? Maybe we wouldn't have to be uh, making tiny improvements in this sort of polluting, uh, dangerous technology we call uh, lawn mowing. And so the conclusion of that part is, is again, just that uh, at best, the way we've been doing risk assessment and regulatory economics is to, is to end up with uh, uh, a, a large document full of quantitation that tells us what to fear rather than what to do. I think that's it and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you um, yeah, for that talk. Uh, so we're going to move on to questions now, but um, to do so, if you've got a question, please uh, click on raise your hand. It's in the participants menu. Uh, so click on, click on participants and you should have an option to raise your hand that's on the uh, right of the menu. Uh, otherwise, if you don't want to uh, talk out your mic, then just type your question in the chat and I'll read it out. Um, but yes, so... Adolphus, uh, you have the first question. Thank you so much, Simon. So uh, good, good afternoon, Professor Adam. So um, first of all, yeah, thank you so much for your insightful discussion this afternoon, really uh, interesting um, content. Um, basically, there are two short, very short questions on my side. Um, the first of which uh, I have to apologize first because I actually uh, missed up halfway through the talk because uh, I, I got caught up for something. Um, so I'm going to miss this part, but if you could help me clarify the first question, uh, which is basically, uh, I think in one of your slides, um, you talk about the seven principles. And on the seventh, uh, I think the seventh uh, point was actually on model uncertainty. Uh, and, um, and I think I briefly saw that, 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 that part before it went to another, before it went to another slide. And uh, basically it said that model uncertainty is treated separately, and uh, which is pretty much what I, I saw before we transited to the next um, slide. Um, my, my question is mainly, and I think you probably might have addressed it, was do you basically choose the model first by ranking and then do the analysis? Or do you do the analysis by considering all models, of course, uh, having weights on, on each of them, the model? Yeah, good question. And I, I glossed over this. So there's a new paper that George Gray and I have written. It should be actually on online at risk analysis within the next week or two. Um, I should say it's 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 one quarter of a paper with four pieces to it. It's sort of a tribute to John Evans, who was our both of our uh, PhD advisors at somewhat different times. Uh, but one of the the four sections is a discussion of this exact problem. And George and I don't really agree. And I I I to this day I'm conflicted. I don't think I, I agree I with myself on this. I think the the way to explain the the paradox is. Um, I've been an advocate for full, exhaustive uh, treatment of uncertainty. I think that we these decisions are so important that we should be putting more time and money and people into the the the, the process of of thinking through what we're about to do. And so I've I've never wanted to be in a position of saying let's just cut corners and not think about some important part of the problem. But on the other hand, I've seen model uncertainty be either abused or just uh, <laughs> turn into a, 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 a maze which people can't extricate themselves from. Right. And for better or worse in the regulatory world, until fairly recently, we addressed this problem uh, 
by deliberately uh, censoring out many of the models that actually ought to have been given some weight. And the, the way we justified it is we talked about defaults. We said, uh, we're going to treat, for example, um, positive evidence that a chemical causes cancer in rats or mice as um, rebuttable evidence that it causes the same uh, disease in humans, even though we know once in a while we're getting a false positive out of that. Yeah. And the reason for doing that was just, I think, a practical one. It makes the process go quicker, but it also, I think, sets up a, a reasonable system of incentives where you basically say, we're, we're ready, we being the government, we're ready to be convinced that we're wrong when we discard all of these alternative theories, but we don't want to bring them in and give them weight just because your self-interest tells you we should do that. If you're really self-interested, then prove it, you know, not necessarily prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, but, but spend the time and the money to give us a good reason to either discard the way we've been thinking about this entirely, or at least to give your alternative theory equal or greater weight to our yeah. preferred default theory. So I sort of come out saying we ought to be, um, regretful and humble about this, but but maybe we shouldn't be trying to declare victory only when we've considered every possible model, because that can be misused and it gives people every incentive to say, uh, well, wait a minute, you've given me 15% weight. And I know if you just gave me 16% weight, the, the number would go down to such an extent that you know my competitor would get the regulation, but I wouldn't. Um, mm. Anyway. It's not. It's not resolved, and I think. I think uh, it makes me uncomfortable to say that, but I think it's. Um, we're not. We're not. No one has come up with a, a good way to avoid either the problem of delay or the problem of, uh, mischief. So it's pretty much like sort of an ongoing issue. Uh, if what that's what I gather. Okay. Um, right. So. Yeah, thank you so much for the for your uh, uh, for addressing this part. Uh, my second question, um, essentially, what I gather from from this talk is that there seems to be like a significant amount of conflicts uh, between what the economists uh, think and what the uh, the decision makers and analysis would actually uh, believe in. And in your view, like, how do you think we could like bridge the gap between these two communities? Because economists would definitely uh, be some form of resistance more often than not in the sense that they care about the, the, the monetary costs in, in, in any decision or any choices that are made. And definitely if something were to, let's say, you know, um, like, like a decision that's made and then it, 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 it's a loss for them, like in financially, they would definitely make a big hoo-ha out of, out of it. And they mainly believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, if I'm not getting it wrong, like in many point estimates rather than like a distribution and, and all, whatnot. So what do you think could, be possibly done to bridge the gap between these two um, like communities? Well, I think, you know, some of it, uh, it's always easy to start with education and say that in, in another generation, if we, if we somehow manage to train economists from the very beginning uh, in, in their textbooks to, to you know, sort of get away from the notion that, you know, the answer is infinitely precise and, and the goal is to, is to, choose a number and that, again, that, that uh, confidence intervals are a sign of, of weakness and you haven't finished, you've just sort of stopped in the middle of all your, if you're left with a confidence interval, maybe you just need to go back and, uh, and think harder. Um, and I, again, ultimately it's in the hands of the decision maker. If, if we have people who are self-confident enough and understand the process enough to say uh, something's wrong here, I, 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 reject the notion that I'm being told to choose among these options based on huge uncertainties on the risk side and point estimates of cost. Uh, I, I don't believe it. I want, I want you guys to go back and be more truthful with me about what the spectrum of possible economic outcomes are here. Um, some of it's as easy as getting back to model uncertainty. The, the, the big model uncertainty in regulatory economics, in my view, is uh, the, the, the overwhelming default model, unfortunately, is when we tally up the costs of regulations and other interventions, really all we're doing is adding up the negative economic 
costs or, or welfare changes to those people who are um, made less well off economically. So the, the losers count and the winners don't count. Mm. So we talk about scrubbers being put on power plants and the exercise is how much does the scrubber cost? How many of them are gonna be required? That's the cost. We don't think about the jobs created in the scrubber industry, which is gonna be larger with the rule than, than without it. That's considered mm -hmm. a, a nicety, but in fact, th those effects could be as larger, larger than the negative effects. So uh, an easy solution, and it's called general equilibrium modeling rather than partial equilibrium. If, if the decision maker said, uh, I reject your lousy partial equilibrium model here, you need to go back and give me a, a real statement of what's gonna happen in the economy, not just in the sector that is in my office every day, threatening me with uh, uh, you know, bodily harm if I, if I regulate them, um, then, then you know, we'd all be more able to see what's happening. Right. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for your yeah. clarifications and your views on, on these uh, questions. So uh, yeah, thank you so much once again. Thank you, Adolphus. Um, Alex, you have a question you want to ask. Yeah. Um, two things, I guess the first one is just sort of a note of um, going about presenting error bars. Are they, is, are they commonly referred to as error bars rather than like uncertainty? I don't bar? know. I because probably I, shouldn't that's... have said it that way. <laughs> I, I certainly heard the term. I mean, I think, I, I think you're right. Confidence intervals or, or PDFs or, or are more precise, but I, um, maybe somebody else can weigh in, but I've certainly heard that term in lots of different disciplines. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I say, cause I know like a lot of the time when you first learn about uh, presenting information like that, you refer to them as, yeah, like error bars, which is just feels like yeah. very much getting off on the wrong foot, like at the ground floor, mixing yeah. as many metaphors no, I, as possible. I agree, it's a yeah. good point. Um, but secondly, just in terms of, um, so the interplay in politics of like people's trust in decision makers and the need for decision makers to appear kind of authoritative and like they know what they're doing and the fact that yeah at present in law in economics it's seen as a sign of weakness to present uncertainty do you think that <clears throat> presenting uncertainty in these decision um support systems or whatever you want to call them as something that can be utilized to make good better decisions rather than something that yeah as you say it's like it's not something to to be afraid of it's something to know to help push things to a, a better position do, do you think it's it's i don't know do, can you see a path to a future where people see uncertainty not as I, I, I basically, could you ever imagine a politician saying that they will deliver some promise and giving uncertainty bounds and that being seen as a good thing? You, you can just say no, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it'd be very hard to say yes in yeah. December of 2020. You know, I think um, five years ago, uh, maybe I should say four years ago uh, in the US, you know, I might have been a little more, um, but obviously we've reached a point where not only is, is uncertainty off the table, but facts are off the table. So it makes it very hard to imagine um, recovering even, even from that. But I, I would say I would go back one step in the process. I, I would say in order to get decision makers comfortable with uncertainty, we need to get them and the public comfortable with outcome. In other words, it's not just the inputs that are uncertain, it's obviously the, the outcomes that are uncertain. And I didn't put the slide up, but I have a slide of, of George W. Bush on the aircraft carrier uh, with the famous banner that they put up, mission accomplished for the, the Iraq war, which turned out to be not nearly over at that, at that time. And I have a slide where I, I put a carrot and I put the word pro uh, probably in the middle of it. And yeah, it's very hard to imagine somebody um, who really wants to say, declare victory to say, I'm declaring probable victory. But I guess I'm still optimistic that if we can get people to understand, the other way to look at it, of course, is if you 
uh, preview for people the reality that the choice that you're about to make is not guaranteed to be successful, then you, if you're self-interested, you have an automatic, you've, you've uh, bought a little insurance policy when it, when it does go, go poorly. You, 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 you don't have to slink away and hope that nobody remembers and pulls out the tape of you saying, essentially, this is guaranteed to work. Uh, so yeah, I think NASA should have said the first 24 times they pushed the button and launched the space shuttle, uh, we're doing a risky thing here and um, we are doing this in full knowledge that, that someday this, this may go poorly, but we think we're gaining enough every time that we get away with it and we're throwing the dice on a high risk uh, exercise. Uh, it would made a, would have made the Challenger explosion not seem like uh, initially a, a freak event, which then was quickly seen to be an absolutely expected event because everybody knew that when the risk is one in 25, about every 25 times it's going to blow up. And I think we just need a better vocabulary for um, you know, just not promising more than you, you can deliver, um, you know, if there's an arms race to promise more than you, you can deliver, obviously we're in the wrong, we're spiraling in the wrong direction. So that, that's more where my pessimism comes in. Yeah. I think, yeah, we, we it's, it does feel very much like lots of things spiraling in the wrong direction yeah. in that yeah. sense of the moment. Yeah. Uh, I think like it, it seems like a long way before a politician giving themselves wiggle room in something that they're going to deliver is seen as a, po is seen as a positive. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And look, it's even, it's even worse because look, we're, you know, we're now looking at, um, the misuse of uncertainty, right? We have 268,000 deaths from COVID in the US and we've got Trump saying, but it wasn't 2 million. I, I found an estimate from March that said 2 million. So I've done a great job. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it's so perverse. And, and um, but again, if you start from the premise that, 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 that 2 million was maybe in this case, not a, not a real number, but if, if the real confidence interval in March of 2020 was from, almost zero to, to 2 million, um, you know, then 268,000, you know, is somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. But of course, it's also much higher than 5,000 or so, which is, you know, there's some number out there that would have been the, uh, the result of, of smarter intervention mm. uh, 10 months ago. Do you think it's all like, maybe this view of risk as like a beneficial aid making decisions better could be sort of like i don't know something useful to start nudging people towards seeing risk as something it's like oh like this person's actually presented uncertainty i can that's useful information like this person's attempting to inform me rather than this individual giving this precise estimate without telling me anything about what this precise estimate is yeah i mean one simple thing um simple but fraught would be for uh, professionals to be more comfortable calling each other out, not just for dirty money and conflicts of interest and, and poaching outside their specialty, uh, but, you know, for being overconfident. And, and mm. the, the niceties of academia, the niceties of government don't, don't allow much of that. But if, if on every panel there was somebody who would raise their hand and say, you know, excuse me, you know, you, you just gave a point estimate that you're going to hope is going to be close to the truth. And you're going to look good, but you know, let's, let's step back and be honest here. You have, you have no idea whether that's half or twice or one tenth or one or 100 fold uh, option is possible. And, you know, let's not, um, you know, lying, lying with point estimates is, is not very different from, from falsifying. Mm -hmm. It just needs that someone to stick the head above the power. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you very, very much for the uh, for the presentation for the answers. Um, just bouncing off that, like, how do you think would you work and try to encourage people to embrace uncertainties? Then, would it be, for example, that solutions first approach you mentioned? Just yeah, well, because it's, I always find some pushback when it comes to yeah. Um, yeah. 
I, I, I'm trying to merge the, 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 two, the two concepts, whether, whether it's a problems first or a solutions first uh, mm. approach to, to structuring the problem. Uh, ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is predict in advance, but also uh, look backwards and, and, and you know, give a sort of postmortem uh, of, of what happened using the language of choice and regret and decision. So I think it's, it's, it's unequivocally better to be able to say, um, here's what we're going to do this is the choice that is about to be made out of a spectrum of choices that includes these one or two or three or four things that, that were not made. Um, that's, that's also dangerous, right? That gives, that gives people the ammunition that they're going to need after the fact to say, um, I've been, I've been thinking about Rudy Giuliani lately for various reasons, you know, he fairly famously uh, tore up a memo that said, uh, you should move the command center out of the World Trade Center in the year 2000. I think it's a dangerous place to put the command center for something where you might be commanding an operation where that building has been the one targeted. Um, so obviously the more notes are in the file saying there was a building 10 blocks away that we wanted you to move the command center to uh, is out there, the worse he looks. Um, because in fact, you know, he made he re, he rejected another option that he doesn't want anyone to ever know was put in front of him. And again, that's where you need people who are willing to say, you know, this was not a preordained choice. There actually were choices rejected, um, but that allows the person, again, who's making the decision to to to. I think ultimately, it's it's more trust building to say. Yeah, I you know I rejected that other choice. Uh, I again I, I'm a Pollyanna about this. I think saying in advance, uh, let's remember that in the future it it may well be revealed to us through state of nature that that option B was better than option A. But this was what I have in front of me now, and we're going with A. And it takes a certain kind of person to be able to say. Um, First of all, sir, it's it's not really in our system that 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 these decisions, and that's kind of the weird thing about it, right? The the people making these decisions in politics usually know that they're no longer going to be in the job when the state of nature is revealed anyway. So why they should be so scared of being around for the post mortem? They're going to be somewhere else anyhow, um, and so it seems to be only to their advantage to say, when when all is said and done. Uh, you know, you, 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 you could praise me for being right or criticize me for being wrong, but I think it's harder to criticize me for being wrong when I'm telling you in advance, I rejected option B for these reasons. Then, oh, we've discovered in the file the missing memo where, you know, you were told what to do and you didn't even want us to know that you were told to do that and you didn't do it. Yeah. It's about really spreading... Um accountability through, yeah. through the operation yeah. so it yeah. isn't yeah yeah um so we don't actually have any more questions popping up in the chat um although a few people have messaged me directly saying um it was interesting to talk but uh so no apologies i can't sure. stay for the questions um scott do you have anything to add at all uh, well no not really but um, I, I guess i do I, I'm shocked, actually, Adam, that the the situation has really not gotten better uh, with all these years of screaming kind of at the top of his, your lungs. The, the, uh, well, certainly the economists haven't gotten better and, and the regulatory agencies haven't heard the message either. No. Um, so Tim Tim Barry, I, I think you know him, who's yeah. at PARD, I think, and he, he used to say, this was a while ago, he used to say that no decision has ever been made uh, in the consciousness of a risk analysis. It's all, all the decisions are horse trades. They're all politically motivated. The only point of a real risk analysis, as much money as we spend on them, is really to be a, you know, a weapon or a cudgel. It's something to beat somebody over the head with, not to actually arrive at uh, a, a reasoned decision. Um, and, and I'm wondering, you know, it seems like 
it's it's pretty expensive to be used for that purpose. I mean, uh, is that always going to be the case? Is risk analysis ever going to see uh, use in anger, and or or is it just this weird sort of parasite? You know, it's 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 like rock and roll. It seems like it's here to stay. Yeah. My question is: Is it ever going to be useful? Yeah, I'm with you on that. I think um, it, it's it's here to stay because people enjoy pretending that it is useful and enjoy pretending that um, uh, Sunstein writes about the you know the stunning triumph of cost benefit and all all we've done is stunningly written about it after the fact. We 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 you know Tim and others at EPA have probably said many times that that every decision is presented as stupid option A, stupid option C, and brilliant option B. And the decision maker picks B, and then somebody writes a thousand pages around that. Um, even if it's written before the fact, it doesn't really matter because the, 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 the dice have been rolled and the dies have been cast. And, um, but, you know, to be constructive, if, if, that's, if that's where we are, you know, I guess you're suggesting a fork in the road, either, either make it more useful or, you know, ad admit that the emperor has no clothes and this is what we're doing. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I agree that either of those would be better than the fiction that we're living under now. Um, obviously, I'd, I'd prefer that we make it more useful. I keep coming back to the mental picture that as expensive as these analyses are, they are a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the stakes of the decisions that we're making. And so when we're gambling with trillions, we ought to be spending millions on uh, choosing better. But I, yeah, I don't see a lot of hope today uh, for, for it getting better. And, you know, we're over here, we've, we've got a big, big change in administration, but um, I've been poking around a little bit around the transition teams. And, you know, my strong sense is that for some good reasons, because of how chaotic the last four years have been over here, uh, the overwhelming uh, desire of the new folks is going to be to get back to 2008 or 2016 as quickly as we can. And there will not be any time to think about, um, you know, returning to the good old days of EPA and OSHA were never so good to begin with. There are things we could do now and things we could, we could only do in 2021 when the agencies that we're coming back to are half empty anyway. Not a good thing that they're half empty, but there will never be a better time to actually uh, hire new people. But it'll be all the old people brought back um, because relatively they were better days than we've just had, but they were, in my view, not nearly good enough. And... But I, you know, I, cert I fully understand that this is not the time to delay the needed return to normalcy with thoughts of doing it better. And it's unfortunate. You know, all these executive orders and all these rules that simply have to be torn up or rescinded, um, that's, that's more important right now than, than getting it right. Um, but human nature, they'll never turn back and get and get it right. They'll declare victory by having undone the damage and then move on to something else. Yeah. Well, I it, certainly that is a victory of sorts. So yeah. But a pretty hollow one. I mean, just, you know, just to get us back to, again, I'm more OSHA centric, but, you know, get us back to a period when we were reliably putting out one new regulation every 10 years instead of four rollbacks in four years and you know that's not a big that's that's a pretty deflating um change but i think that's what we're what we're headed for thank you i think we have another question uh by ping hi hi uh hi. i just put my face there that's right okay hi um i'm a coastal engineer and so uh scott just mentioned about this uh this is sort of bleak situation in getting the decision makers to adopt uh, risk certainty uh, in their policies. Uh, um, in, in my area of research, um, when you look at sea walls, okay, sea walls, when they get overtopped, water coming in, and has always been designed in deterministic way. But in the last 30 years, particularly the last 20 years, 
a probabilistic approach has been adopted across Europe. And also the, the, the methodology has been adopted by US as well. And so its main driver is the insurance company. So insurance companies say that, so it's just tell me a volume and then you can give me an area of flood. But actually every year I get sometimes more, sometimes less. So I need more information. I think this is why the solution-based uh, 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 focus approach, it, I, I, I like the idea. Uh, and uh, an obvious solution uh, a focus can never deviate from the problem it solves. But, but the, 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 the angle is the right one and uh, it's meeting the need. And, but that was the triumph uh, as a coastal engineering community, research community. Um, but then I stopped. And that's the only area where this approach is adopted. And the bigger area is coastal erosion. With the sea level rise, global warming, 75% of the world coastline is eroding. And also uh, you have uh, big rivers delivering quantity, huge quantity of sediment in the past, building up delta. But now with the, with the, with the building of reservoirs and better land conservation, greening, uh, everything, and there's less sediment coming in to the estuary. So estuary is uh, de depleting. So the big problem is erosion. But, but that idea has not been adopted. And that people still say, um, in 50 years time, this cliff is going to say 20 meters uh, uh, from the present coastline. And obviously there's a variability. And some people have been pushing in the past 20 years for adopting probabilistic approach. But uh, one counter argument from the policy uh, area is predicting coastal erosion is a lot more complicated from process angle than predicting flooding. So unless your scientists sort out the, the, the physical processes you're dealing with, and uh, we are not moving in that direction. And recently EPSRC come up with this new scheme of fellowship. And uh, that fellowship requirement, apart from the, the best science, and also uh, sort of a connecting communities and implementing changes. So I'm thinking about that area. Uh, and uh, that's why I come to listen to your talk, which is very, uh, very, very useful and timely for me uh, to have appreciation. Now, the question is, do you wait until the physical problem gets solved? And then you have more confidence to sell the policymakers, uh, the uncertainty methodology and analysis and principles. Or you say, actually, it's the opposite because it's, un, 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 it's difficult to predict. And that's where you need uncertainty methodology. Well, neither of those are, are my area, which I know much of anything. All, you know, all I would say is, again, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a vocabulary problem. It's a problem that, that we, the, 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 the way our brains are wired, the way we use language, we think of decisions as being affirmative acts. We can quote, wait to decide, the, the, the term wait to decide. I think it's a pernicious one because what, what we're not understanding is that for those of us who, who who's, you know, my, my job used to be to, to, to decide things, um, I like to think that every day when I went home at the end of the day, I would think, what did I decide today? And, and very often the answer was, I made the decision to, to have tomorrow look just like today which is a fancy way of saying I didn't do anything, but I've really done something. I've preserved the status quo for one more day. And if we were, if we were better at understanding that quote, you know, waiting to decide because we need to understand the problem better, it's often exactly the right thing to do, but we need to understand better that that's, if you do that for a year, that's 365 decisions, you know, tomorrow is like today. And if there, if there are, risks and costs to that, um, then you're in the position of unfortunately having to say, you know, maybe we should do something affirmative, not just come back tomorrow, even if that affirmative thing is highly 
uh, uninformed. At, at least it's affirmative. Um, you know, and then I, on the solution focus, I guess I would, knowing nothing about your area, I would say, you know, if the human need is sh shelter, then, you know, one way of looking at the solution is, uh, yeah, we have uh, sea level rise. Um, you know, can we work on the getting people away from the sea rather than getting the sea away from people? And I know that that's fraught and that's, you know, just a, a incredibly callous thing to say, but, um, you know, that's the other way of looking at that, at that problem. Um, that's correct. That's definitely correct. There's two yeah. uh, way of looking at it. And uh, the way you just put uh, uh, to keep sea away has been always coast engineers uh, job, but uh, move, uh, uh, give the, the coast uh, to the sea uh, and then do a coastal retreat. And that's also a, a advocated solution. And of course, it's unfortunate that, the, that in, in, at least in my naive view, the people who've been saying, um, I guess the terminology is, is, is adapt rather than mitigate, the adapting uh, folks are, are really many times trying to say, uh, you know, keep my business afloat. Don't, don't make me decarbonize. Don't, don't make me stop mining coal. Uh, we'll talk about adaptation. If we could do both, if we could, you know, it, I believe we need to transition away from coal. I think we should have told the, the, the coal industry 50 years ago, you've got 50 years left and we're gonna give you plenty of time to get your grandchildren out of this business. Uh, but, you know, if adaptation is seen with good reason as only the province of self-interested people who really just don't want the problem fixed at all, then it's gonna to continue to get a, a black eye. I, I had a black eye in my mind for a long time. I thought, why are these people talking about, you know, why don't we just, solve it and not adapt to it. But I, I'm coming around to the view that uh, both are necessary. We just, we can't use one as an excuse not to do the other. Yeah, uh, solving it is somebody else paying for it. Yeah. Adapting yeah. is you, you have to pay a proportion of it. And that, that's why it's so difficult. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions. If anyone has anything else to add, uh, jump in now. Otherwise, um, yeah, I'd like to formally close the session and uh, thank Adam for his talk. Yeah, so thank you uh, very much for you. giving us a virtual visit. My pleasure. It's a little weird only seeing one live face <laughs> and a lot of names, but now I see, oh, there we go. <laughs> They're really out there. <laughs>